Lynn Hiles Ministries presents Dr. Lynn Hiles, That You Might Have Life. And here's your host, Dr. Lynn Hiles. Come on to Dr. Lynn Hiles as he comes right now. Come on, church, you can do better than that. Give a good welcome to Dr. Lynn Hiles. Thank you so much. You can be seated. It is an honor to be here. We are honored to be here this morning in this great church, and I, I believe to be part of a great grace movement. Can you say amen to that? Uh, you know, I believe that, I said this to Pastor Ben yesterday in the car, I believe that Calvary Church, the Gospel Circles, GC, uh, Gospel Circle Institute, I truly believe we will go down in history as a part of a ongoing reformation. And I believe that uh, this is a leading voice, a leading church in that, and I encourage you to get behind what's happening in this house. It is a honor to be here. I, I got to say, when I've this is 41 years of full-time traveling for ministry for me, and I never dreamed that uh, the gospel of grace would expand like it has, and we're just getting started. But I, 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 it's, uh, it's almost uh, a little bit nostalgic because there was a time when people wouldn't walk across the road to spit on you when you were preaching grace, and now they want to get their picture taken with you. So uh, don't, don't hold back. Get on the boat. Hallelujah. I want to get in the Word this morning. It is an honor to be here again. I appreciate so much Pastor Ben, Pastor Kim, all of the guys here. The culture of this church reminds me of what the Queen of Sheba said when she came to see the house of Solomon. The house has never, the half has never been told. Happy are thy servants. The people seem to enjoy doing what they do here. They don't seem to be under pressure. And I think that's a great testament to not only the gospel, but the culture of grace that's in this house. You ought to give yourself a hand clap today. I'm going to uh, share a little bit this morning. Uh, I want to take a text from the book of Galatians. I'm going to read, uh, first of all, from the Amplified Bible. And my, my, uh, my thought this morning is, I want to talk about the thought that uh, the Scripture said, these two women are two covenants. Let me tell you that I was in the ministry before, I was in the ministry for years before it really dawned on me and to many people that the new covenant is not an addendum to the old one. I'm going to let that settle in for a moment. How many know it's not? The new covenant is not Jesus plus the rules. How many know the old covenant is a law you have to keep, and the new covenant is receiving a life that will keep you? Come on, somebody. How many know the old covenant is about rules, and the new covenant is about a relationship? The old covenant motivates you by fear, and the new covenant you are moved by faith. Hallelujah. How many know under the old covenant you do it because you have to, and the new covenant you do it because you fell in love with somebody? And I believe the real gospel will give you back your life. And the reason I'm so passionate about it is because I believe it gives people back the abundant life that Jesus really intended for us to have. How I many know he did? You know, we have offered the gospel and wonder why people don't come to it by the droves. Like, come to Jesus, he'll pull you through and not hold backwards. You know, you have to go through all kinds of stuff. And I was like, that, that's real appealing there. You know, I'm already going through some stuff. But how I many know that Jesus said, I came not just to give you a ticket to heaven after you lived 70 or 80 years in misery here on earth trying to suffer through this thing, but I came to give you life and that more abundantly. And he said that that life would become the light. The writer of Deuteronomy said, I want to give you as the days of heaven on earth. And I used to think that the gospel was simply about how I get from here to there if I could keep all the rules. And I do believe there's a there, but the, the, the reality of it is, is the gospel is not about how I get from here to there. It's about how I get what's happening there to operate here. It is God saying, I want to give you as the days of heaven on earth, thy kingdom come, your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And when you first get a hold of the gospel of grace, this sneaking grin gets on your face like this is too good to be true. And you just ride down the road, almost lean back in your seat thinking this is too good to be true, but it is. And then you start to realize, man, I just want to share this with everybody. Hallelujah. I want everybody to get it. Let me take a text here this morning because we're going to uh, share in this first service under the second several services today. Galatians 4.21 from the Amplified it says, tell me, you who are bent on being under the law, will you listen to what the law really says? 
For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the bondmaid and one by the free woman. But whereas the child of the slave woman was born according to the flesh and had an ordinary birth, and the son of the free woman was born in fulfillment of the promise. Verse 24 says, now all of this is an allegory. It's a picture. It's a story. It's trying to show us something. Now all of this is an allegory. These women represent two covenants. Say that with me. These women represent two covenants. One covenant originated from Mount Sinai where the law was given and bears children destined for slavery. This is Hagar. How many know the law was given on Mount Sinai? Now, Hagar is and stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia, and she corresponds to and belongs in the same category with the present Jerusalem, for she is in bondage together with her children. But the Jerusalem above, the messianic kingdom of Christ, is free, and she is our mother. For it is written in the scriptures, Rejoice, O barren woman who has not given birth to children. Break forth into a joyful shout, you who are not feeling birth pains. For the desolate woman has many more children than she who has a husband. But we, brethren, are children, not by physical descent as was Ishmael, but like Isaac, born in virtue of the promise. How many of you have been born again today based on the promise of God? Come on. And just as at that time the child of the ordinary birth, born according to the flesh, despised and persecuted him who was born remarkably, According to the promise and working of the Holy Spirit, so it is now also. How many know folk that don't understand the gospel of grace will persecute those who do understand it? How many know those that are in bondage want to persecute? That's what the scripture talks about with Ishmael is they persecuted those that were born by supernatural birth and they want to mock and make fun of it. But the truth of it is, is that how many know sometimes they make fun of you because they want to get as free as you are and they're jealous of your freedom. I need some help in here this morning. Hallelujah. And so he says, you know, just at that time, the, the, the child of the ordinary birth uh, get despised and persecuted him. He was born remarkably. See, most of our persecution doesn't come from the world. It comes from the church. You know, the scripture said that Jesus was a friend of sinners, and they said that uh, to him as it maybe it would be an insult. But actually, I think it's a badge of honor. There was something about him that people who didn't make the, what, weren't what I call glow-in-the-dark Christians could be comfortable around him. Hallelujah. I believe Jesus is so good that you want to hang out with him. And the more you get to know him, the more you're going to want to hang out with him. Now, let me just finish the scripture, then I'm going to preach just a little bit. It said, uh, it goes on to say, but, um, but what does the scripture say? Cast out and send away the slave woman and her son. Watch this, for never shall the son of the slave woman be heir and share in the inheritance with the son of the free woman. So, brethren, we who are born again are not children of the slave woman, the natural but of the free, the supernatural. I want to talk about two covenants this morning because let me just talk a little bit about my history. and We'll, uh, we'll, we'll just flow here a little bit if you'll help me. I, I was raised, I tell people I was raised in classical Pentecost under what I call terrorist preachers. <laughs> And, uh, I, I, you know, I say with respect because I believe those men did the best they could with what they knew. But we would start what I call, you know, back in the days when I was growing up, there wasn't two, three day meetings. They were six week revivals and you had to go every night or you was going to go to hell. And these guys would come in and they, their wife looked like, you know, granny from the Beverly Hillbillies because they wasn't allowed to wear makeup or anything in style. And so the preacher looked like he fell off the cover of Fortune 500 and he'd have suspenders and come in and he looked like he must have picked a fight with his wife on the way to church just to get his game face on because he was mean looking. And when he got ready to preach, he had to really kind of be mean. And you're like, a, but I, what I realized is the longer you under law, the more miserable you get. It will make you mean. Come on, somebody. And then they would come in and they would put, stand up to preach. And I would be excited about revival because we're going to start a six-week revival. And this dude would pull his pants about midway up his chest, his glasses down on his nose. And he'd rear back and say, you want me to name sin. <sighs> you got to hack a little bit when you do that. 
I'm going to name it for you this morning. <laughs> Some of you women came in here with makeup on your Jezebel face. <laughs> Head levelers on your head. <laughs> you got a hell of vision set up in your living room. <laughs> you eating deviled ham, <laughs> devil food cake, <laughs> deviled eggs. <laughs> and you wonder why God, you got to stretch God out. <laughs> God ain't moving in the church. It's because you want to compromise and you got to shake your jaws when you say combo. And I thought, my God, I thought I was saved when we started, but my Lord, if, if devil food go take cake going to take me to hell, then I probably don't got a real good chance at all. We shot our television. We called it a television set. Devil's horns on your roof. You watching that television? That was when Andy Griffith was on, man. We've come a long way, baby. Now I'm on it five times a week. Hallelujah. <laughs> We used to preach against devil food cake. We used to preach against Coca-Cola. I don't want to get sidetracked here too long, but I, you know, we preach against Coca-Cola. I said to my pastor one day, I hope you're sorry for me to say this. I said to my pastor, what about a Coca-Cola is going to take me to hell? He said, son, he couldn't even talk to him in his regular voice. I had to talk with his preacher voice, you know, son, <laughs> you drinking that Coca-Cola from a bottle. And it's going to make somebody think you drinking something else and it's going to ruin your testimony. And I said, well, then why don't we preach against root beer? That's in a brown bottle. And he looked at me and he said, son, that Coca-Cola is shaped like a woman and it's liable to make you lust. And I'm 16 years old and I said, thanks for that image. So I, I struggled with Coke till I got in my 40s. Y'all don't want to help me preach in here this morning. Then they came out with three liter bottles and I got over it. Hallelujah. Yeah. But I thought yesterday as we were talking about, I think it was Pastor Chris's daughter's graduating high school. I thought in my own gr uh, growing up, it was, it was a sin to go to your high school prom. You couldn't dance. You couldn't see a movie. We have come a long way. But how many know that was all stuff that wasn't even even. We preached. We sent people to hell for stuff we wouldn't even send them to jail for in America. Come on, somebody. And it was stuff that wasn't even in the Bible that somebody heard somebody else say. But it was a covenant that always alienated you from God. It was a treadmill of performance. It was always lies that kept you away from, from the presence of God. And you wonder why I, I talk about sometimes we have what we call Christers that come to our church. You say, what is that? That's people who come Christmas and Easter. And I don't blame them because the two times they do come, we gang up on them and beat them up and tell them how dirty, rotten scoundrels they are and how bad of sinners they are. And it never is is the good news and wonder why they don't come back till Christmas. I don't blame you. I don't want to go there either. Come on. How many know what the gospel is really the good news? And the good news, come on, is not that you're a dirty, rotten scoundrel. The good news is because, listen, the Old Testament is about what you do. The New Testament is about what he's done. Hallelujah. The Old Covenant was full of demands with no supply, but the New Covenant is full of supply without any demand. And the more you start to understand that, the more you start to fall in love with the Jesus who's not out to take your life. He wants to give you the best life on the planet and so I thought you know as I listen as I thought about this these two women are two covenants man I just want to grab a, a couple of real powerful thoughts for us this morning but Hebrews the 11th chapter verse 8 says by faith Abraham when he was called called to go out into a place what he should after receive for inheritance obeyed and went out not knowing whither he went, by faith he sojourned in the land of promises in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Watch this. This is what I'm after. Through faith, also Sarah herself, watch this, God never attributed Isaac to the faith of Abraham. He attributes it to the faith of Sarah. By faith, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because 
She judged him faithful that promised. Come on, somebody. Some of you got some promises that don't look like anything's happening. Some of you may look like what Galatians said, sing, O barren, that there ain't nothing happening in your life and there doesn't even seem to be any fruit in your Christian journey. But I want you to know something. It's not about you. It's about him. If you'll judge him faithful that promised, it's not about what you can produce. Come on. It's about what he's doing inside of you through the union with him and through the intimacy that you have in relationship. And so Sarah herself received strength to conceive when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore there sprang even of one, watch this, and him as good as dead. You know when the Bible say you as good as dead and or the Bible say you old, you old. My mother said to me back uh, before she passed, she said, have you noticed there's not very many old people around anymore? I said, Mom, when there's nobody above you, you are the old people. How <laughs> I many know oh, the older you get, the more your concept of old changes? Now, I want to put some context to this. Sarah's 90 years old. Abraham is 99. So when the Bible say he's as good as dead, and he, we'll get over here and look at it in Genesis for a moment, but it says he was well stricken in years. When the Bible say you old, you old. Hallelujah. Now, like I said, my concept of old changes real quick. I used to think people my age was old. Now I'm starting thinking, hallelujah. I'm looking for anybody that's older than I am, way up there, you know. I just had a friend who was a pastor in Pittsburgh, and she passed away last year. She was 103 and a half when she passed away. Still wore makeup and high heels. Wasn't on any kind of medication. Hallelujah. Took a trip to Africa when she was 100. I, I, that's some good stuff right there. Hallelujah. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I'm in my 60s. I won't tell you exactly how old I am, but I can't imagine having a baby when I'm 90. Oh, y'all don't want to help me preach. I don't know if that's a blessing or a nightmare. <laughs> my son uh, and his wife, my son is 40, I think 45, and, and uh, they have a two-year-old. I can't imagine having a two-year-old even at age 45. When I was 45, my son was living in Columbus, Ohio, working in a ministry. So I'd hate to start over at 45. I don't know at 90 if a baby's a blessing or a curse. But it was the promise of God. And, and, and so it said that, uh, you know, out of this woman, a matter of fact, there are four women that are mentioned in the lineage of Christ in, in Matthew, and all of them are surrounded by some kind of either difficulty or scandal. I won't go into that. But I do want to read this, this, this uh, story a little bit from uh, Genesis, and we're going to try to make a few comments about these two women and then get out your road here this morning. But it says in Genesis 17, God said, Sarah, thy wife, shall bear thee a son, indeed. And thou shalt call his name Isaac. And I will establish, I will, will establish with Isaac, which uh, I, I, I lost my place there. And it says, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant with his seed after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this time of, in the next year. And he left off talking with him, and God went up from Abraham. And Abraham took Ishmael his son, and all that were born in his house, and all that were bought with his money, every male among them, uh, of, of, of Abraham's house, and circumcised the the flesh of their foreskin in the self same day and God said unto him and Abram Abraham was 90 years old and nine when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin I don't know if I want to go to this church <laughs> I saw a meme on Facebook the other day it was a guy with a real bad look on his face and it said the guy that arrived one day before Paul's letter got to church at Jerusalem about we don't have to circumcise people anymore <laughs> But how many know being under law is just about like that? Come on, somebody help me just a little bit. It can be painful. But see, let me just say this to you. Ishmael represents the old covenant, what you can produce. And I want to say this as well, because the scripture says that Abraham never staggered at the promise of God. That means to me that he produced Ishmael by faith. You say, what do you mean, Brother House? What I mean is he took his faith and went to Hagar's tent. Make it plain, Dr. House. I mean, he took his faith and mixed it with an old covenant paradigm, and what he produced looked holy in the face, but it had the heart of an Egyptian beaten in its breast. 
And God said, this is not what's going to be the heir. What you can produce with your faith and your works and your labor and your sweat and your human performance, come on somebody, is only going to persecute something a little bit later. And if you don't think your personal choices make any difference, that one trip to Hagar's tent 2,000 years later, what's happening in the Middle East now right now is them still fighting each other over one trip to Hagar's tent. If you think it don't make a difference what you do, you might ought to rethink that. Come on, somebody. And I really think even a lot of our political problems would go away if we start preaching the right covenant because it affects everything and how people think on every level. I'm going to tell you, there is a massive reformation going on. There's a movement called grace. Somebody's going to be captured by it after a while, and they're going to begin to walk in a different way and say, listen, man, I have taken my faith and tried to hold my mouth the right way, say it the right way, and I'm not against the word of faith. I'm just saying if you have faith and don't have grace, you're going to get out of balance. And if you have grace and you don't mix it with faith, you're going to, because it's not either or, it's the dynamic duo. It is by grace through faith. And when you get grace and you realize what God's already done for you, who he's already made you to be, who you're already in union with, who already lives inside of you, once you know who you are, come on somebody, and you start to believe it, what you do won't happen out of trying to be something. It'll happen because you already are. Hallelujah. Now let me come on back here just for a moment to set the stage for this because God drops back by. He gives him the promise of God, tells him it's not going to be Ishmael that's going to be the heir. And you know, let me just say this concerning Ishmael. Ishmael looked so much like what we're looking for that Abraham would pray, Oh God, let Ishmael live forever. In other words, we're trying to hold on to a religious system that really looks holy. It looks good. It looks like Abraham in the face. But it's got the heart of an Egyptian. It's full of bondage. It's a slave mentality. It's not a sonship mentality. It's an orphan mentality. They don't know that God is Abba. He is Daddy. He's not an old man on a Victorian chair with a club in his hand ready to slap you upside your head. He's a good, good father. Hallelujah. And he likes to dote on you. He likes, as a matter of fact, it is his good pleasure to give you the kingdom. That's how God enjoys himself. My response is, come on, hallelujah. Enjoy yourself today, Abba. Hallelujah, enjoy yourself. Give us the kingdom. Now let me go on down through here, but it goes on to say that God began to drop by. He was 90 years old, nine, when he got, uh, when he got circumcised. God drops by the tent. I'm going to skip through some of this a little bit. But the, the, the angels of the Lord come back by his tent a little bit later in the same chapter, or chapter 18, the Lord appears to him in the plains of Mamre and the tent, and he goes and he tells Sarah, he says, go dress a kid and get, bake ready some cakes. In verse 9 of chapter 18, he, it says, and, and they said unto him, where is Sarah thy wife? He said, where, where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son, and Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Therefore, as Sarah laughed within herself, saying, after, watch this, here's the key thought that I want to share this morning. And, and, and she laughed within herself, saying, after I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure? my Lord also being old. And the Lord said to Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, and saying, Shall I surety bear a child which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the, at the appointed time I will return to, to thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not, for she was afraid. And, she, and he said, Nay, but thou did laugh. I want to just stop and tell you this this morning. Sarah is in the tent, and they, listen, do you think this is the first time in 90 years they've ever tried to have a baby? The pressure to produce somehow will drain the romance out of this thing. If you've ever known couples who are trying to have a child, and they go through all kinds of stuff to try to conceive a child, 
And you've had this promise of God for years and you can't conceive. I'm going to tell you what, it's probably going to get the romance out of this because it's like, okay, what? It is 933. My temperature is 100.3. I am ovulating. Let's go. We are going to have this baby. How many know after a while, you're going to lose that love and feeling? Y'all ain't going to help me this morning. You say, why are you telling us this, Brother House? Because the pressure we put on people to produce something beyond their natural ability has literally drained the joy out of their relationship with Jesus. Come on, somebody. And what we've done is make it so mechanical and we've made it so methodical and we've made it so uh, 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 anesthetized that we are literally don't have any feeling. It's just so mechanical that we're going through the motions of Christianity. And I don't think that Sarah was laughing simply at the fact that she that God was giving her this promise. I think this is the question. And she hears the angel of the Lord say, I'm going to return unto you and you're going to have a child according to the time of life. You're going to have a baby. And this was her question. She didn't say, can I have a baby? She said, forget a baby at this junction. I just want to know if I can have pleasure again. Y'all don't want to help me. Hallelujah. <laughs> My Lord also being old. Have you seen? I think she's probably. Have you seen the old man sitting outside that tent? He looked like a sweet potato with toothpicks for legs. Looked like a California raisin with a hat on out there. Got stubble for a beard. Come on, somebody. And I just want to know at this point, I want to know, not can I have a baby. I just want to know if I can have pleasure again with my Lord. Y'all ain't hear where I'm coming from. I want to know if, oh, hallelujah. I want to know if I can start to enjoy the journey again. I want to know if I can get my joy back. Hallelujah. I want to know if I can get my peace back. I want to know if I can. Listen, can I tell you when I got an understanding of the grace of God and I start understanding that my righteousness was not on the basis of my performance. Can I tell you my peace started to come back? And when my peace started to come back, I started to get a sneaking grin on my face like I'm not in. I'm not out. I'm not. He loves me. He loves me not. I hope I die when he loves me. He loves me. He can't stop loving me. It's a divine role. Romance. Uh, it is a joy. It is an enjoying the journey. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. And the moment I realized I was righteous, I got my peace back in the third dimension and started to hit me. I got my joy back. Uh, and when I got my joy back, uh, the Holy Ghost said to me, Here's what gave Sarah strength to conceive. Uh, she by faith received strength to conceive. I said, What was the strength? He said, The joy of the Lord is your strength. When you get the joy of this relationship back, that it's not about rules. It's about a relationship. It's about falling head over heels in love with the lover of your soul who is not mad at you. He is mad about you. Abraham walked through the tent. By the way, he just had lunch with Melchizedek. You say, who is that? That's the priest of the Most High God. And the new covenant says he's a more excellent priest than Levi was. I am excited to announce the release of my latest book titled The Great I Am. In this book we will explore the seven times in the Gospel of John that Jesus says, I am. When he uses that phrase, it is always in contrast to something from the Old Covenant. For instance, they thought Moses and the law was the door into the sheepfold, but Jesus said to them, I am the door. They thought that Israel was the true vine, but Jesus said to them, I am the vine, you are the branches. As you read the pages of this book, you will discover that Jesus removed the covenant of death and replaced it with the covenant of life. Get your copy of the book, The Great I Am, today.